Good evening, I'm Russ Reesinger with a look at today's top stories. The search for a missing 22 year old Billings woman is over. The body found along the Yellowstone River this past weekend is now officially identified as 22 year old Amelia Brooks. Sheriff Mike Linder says an autopsy completed today found no signs of foul play. A hunter found, found Brooks body near Arrow Island Park Saturday morning. That body heavily decomposed. Now Brooks was last apparently seen at a home in the Billings Heights on October 13th and reported missing to police two days later. Linder says the cause of death is pending toxicology reports, which could take a few months to complete. Amelia's friends and family searched for her for seven weeks. There's now a GoFundMe account set up to help with her funeral expenses. You can find that link within this story, as well as an address to send donations on KTBQ.com. Billings police are looking for a suspect who fled on foot last night after shooting a man multiple times, leaving him to die in the street where he was eventually run over by a passing car. Shooting happened outside a church in the 500 block of Broadwater Avenue just before 9 o'clock. Police say the 30 year old male victim died on the scene. Police say no arrests have been made. So far, they do not have a suspect description to share. The driver is not believed to be related to the shooting. Told officers the victim was lying in the street when he ran him over. Man's name has not yet been released. That autopsy is set for tomorrow. That's a look at today's MTN headlines. Have a good evening. Lewis and Clark public health leaders say in light of the continued jump in COVID-19 cases, it's important for people to make a plan if they're going to go out for holiday shopping. It's a typical Black Friday when everybody goes out on Friday and, and, and shops. But what we're, what we're hoping to see and what we need um, our residents to understand is um, if you spread out your shopping instead of doing it all at once, um, that that will help because we want to reduce the crowds. County Health Officer Drenda Neiman recommends shopping virtually or ordering ahead for a curbside pickup when possible. She suggests those going in person consider smaller local businesses and wait for less busy times to avoid crowds if they're shopping at a large store. Public Health is also asking businesses to help provide alternate shopping options if they can, and in some cases limit the number of people in a store at one time. It's really risky right now. We have widespread disease happening in Lewis and Clark County, and businesses can really help us out by encouraging their shoppers to shop a little differently this year. They also stress the importance of wearing masks. If someone can't wear a mask, Neiman recommends businesses find different ways of serving them instead of having them come inside. Accommodate by offering up curbside delivery um, and things like that so that people can still access the goods that they're looking for in a more safe opportunity. Public Health says it's especially important to be cautious over the next few days, as some people may have been exposed to the virus over Thanksgiving. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. I'm Jordan Johnson here in downtown Kalispell, where one local business is using Small Business Saturday to give back to food banks in the Flathead Valley. Small businesses and everybody needs it right now. I think there's a lot of expectations anymore that there's supposed to be discounts, and I think that's a little frustrating sometimes. Hence why I kind of spun it around. I'd rather donate to our community. Nicole Janes is the Sage and Cedar owner and says that with the holiday season quickly approaching, she would rather give back. I just thought we would use this weekend, Black Friday and today, to see how much money we could raise. Um, so that includes our online sales and both stores and the money will be split between the Flathead Food Bank and the North Valley Food Bank. From skin care and body washes to bath bombs and customizable fragrances, Sage and Cedar has something for everyone to relax and love the skin they are in. Jane says that COVID-19 has made some aspects of the business difficult. I, it's made us have to, have to rethink a little bit how we go about business. Um, my main goal is keeping my staff healthy and safe, and I think that's been a challenge um, on some levels where people don't want to wear a mask. Janes wants to encourage the community to shop small due to some businesses struggling to stay afloat in the pandemic. Uh, everybody's hurting, so it takes a village. So I recommend that people get out there, shop small, and um, stay healthy. In Kalispell, Jordan Johnson, MTN News.
The Justice Department has not uncovered any widespread voter fraud that would change the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Attorney General William Barr's comments to the Associated Press come despite President Trump's continued insistence that such voter fraud exists. A record 96,039 people in the United States are currently hospitalized with COVID-19, according to data published by the COVID Tracking Project. The states with the most people currently hospitalized with COVID-19 are Texas, California, Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Germany is building its first vaccine center in the gymnasium of a high school. Once vaccines are available for distribution, this place aims to deliver up to 1,000 doses per day. Meanwhile, pharmaceuticals companies BioNTech and Pfizer have submitted a formal application for conditional marketing authorization to the European Medicines Agency in order to get authorization for their COVID-19 vaccine. The submitted clinical data demonstrated a vaccine efficacy rate of 95% in phase three clinical study participants without prior infection. In many ways, we've come a long way since March when the pandemic first began, but in others, we haven't. Infections and hospitalizations from COVID-19 are rising quickly as states consider similar shutdown measures. We talked with two healthcare workers who treat COVID patients daily, and they say this time around, they're using what they learned in March, April, and May to better treat people. If there is anyone to help navigate the uncertainty hospitals have faced since spring. It has been very busy and it has really, as you mentioned, gone up in the last two weeks. Dr. Julia Limes is it. My second year of residency was the Aurora Theater shooting and I was on, I was the ICU resident that night. That night, she helped manage the response to a disaster that forced police officers to use their patrol cars as ambulances when a gunman killed 12 people at a movie theater in Colorado and injured 70 more. An unprecedented situation that has brought clarity to the one she finds herself in now. We have started deploying um, people from other parts of the hospital to come and help us on both the COVID floors and the COVID ICU. Across the country, hospitalizations from COVID-19 are rising fast. We've already surpassed the numbers from the first surge. So we're kind of like, okay, what's next? For critical care nurses like Maddie Smith, the fear, stress, unpredictability might have consumed her once more if it wasn't for the lessons learned in this very COVID unit you see before you. We just know how to treat them better and we know when to intervene like sooner versus later with you know different interventions. So that's been really helpful. Because of the dangerous nature of what is in here, the hospital shot this video for us. It shows the practice of undeniable strides that have been made in hospitals since March. Medications to treat COVID symptoms are available. Vaccines are being developed with remarkable effectiveness. And the arc of how a patient might respond to symptoms is now better known. It's easier and it's smoother than it was in the spring. Dr. Lyme says it allows them to manage bed space better and adds a critical element to care, composure, that can be seen in how patients are treated and how these first responders treat themselves. It was hard. I mean, I think the biggest part that got to all of us was that these people, they don't have family to be with. That first surge, it all hit us pretty hard because of the um, sadness that, you know, what happened down here. Um, so, yeah, we just kind of leaned on each other and got through it. But it was, it was tough. How far this current wave will go is unknown, but by drawing from the past, these first responders know they'll be ready to deal with it, no matter what is thrown their way. We just have a better sense of the trajectory and that that is hugely valuable, I think, as we go into this next surge. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. Thousands of America's movie theaters have been in limbo since the pandemic first began. It's estimated 70% of theaters will have to shut down by the end of the year without federal funding. Now some cinemas are trying new ways to save from going dark for good. It's the holiday season and one of America's favorite pastimes is going to the movies. You can just sit down, have some popcorn, just eat some snacks. That's why watching movies in a theater is, is where it's at. But with indoor viewing no longer an option for many theaters, the cinema industry is adjusting. You know, shut down the box office early in the process 
So all of our tickets are online. And then we also uh, added um, a order in advance module to order your concessions or food. Tim League is the chairman of Alamo Drafthouse Cinema. Prior to the pandemic, they employed about 5,500 people in 41 locations from New York to California. Though the number of employees is now around 500, League says there is a silver lining for having silver screens go black. Although we have a, you know, a smaller crew, we are using this time to um, reimagine the guest experience and to test some things out. Alamo recently built a video on demand platform with online interaction which has expanded its audience internationally. We'll put on events and we'll have people joining us from, from London, from Czechoslovakia, from all over the place that have heard about the Alamo and wanted to experience it, but hadn't had an opportunity. An opportunity to try new ways of watching movies and making money, all while following COVID safety guidelines. Even if you're open, it's really difficult to uh, stay profitable at this point. Patrick Cocorin is with the National Association of Theater Owners. He says even with new options like private screenings and outdoor viewing, most of the country's theaters will go dark without government funding or new blockbuster films. We're kind of uh, reached a number of about 70% uh, that are going to have to shut down by the end of the year. Uh, without help or without new movies. And while the movie industry adjusts during the pandemic, their audience says they will return, but with mixed emotions. I need, I need to go to the theater and watch some movies or at least one movie. But yeah, I'm always skeptical about it. You know, I'm gonna just have to be more careful about everything. I'm Kai Beach reporting. It's that time of the year again, Christmas movie season. The holiday-focused genre entirely devoted to people finding love in their hometowns, saving small businesses from big city corporations, and most importantly, spreading the spirit of Christmas. It's just something my mom and I bonded over. We spent a lot of time watching Christmas movies. I started watching them with my family just to kind of poke fun at them, but I accidentally fell in love with them. No other company revels in this genre better than Hallmark. The company releases 40 new Christmas movies every year for its Countdown to Christmas series. Oh, it's finally Christmas! Okay, well, technically it's still fall, but... Christmas is Hallmark's biggest present, with total viewership in the tens of millions, particularly women. Already, the network says it has seen 35 million viewers since October. I love Christmas. Um, I love it. I mean, I'm wearing a sweater in November. I'm ready to go. So we have a Facebook group. We have a Discord. We have a Reddit. And we're continually engaging with way more people than we anticipated ever. We found dozens of year-round blogs, podcasts, and fan groups about Hallmark and Christmas movies, from projects like Tis the Podcast, a show and online community about Christmas movies in general, The Hall Remark, a one-woman recap and review blog, and Deck the Hallmark, a viral podcast that started an entire network of other entertainment shows. If you know, if I can be honest, it was just a prank against against Dan here yes. because I knew he'd hate him. Yeah. Um. And uh, you know, it's a, a few prank years. that's lasted three years. It really, and, and it's a long prank. Has become a full time job. I was genuinely shocked to find out that there were dozens of podcasts, other blogs, and it was really cool to meet other people who actually loved them because I can't talk about <laughs> talk to my friends about <laughs> these. <laughs> Both fans and critics of the genre do recognize that most of these titles have their flaws. They all recognize they can be a little over the top, repetitive, and very predictable. Christmas. It's about traditions. This was ours. We've all joked about creating a, a formulaic Hallmark Christmas movie script together, um, or setting up an AI robot, an AI machine to do the same thing. But at the end of the day, these movies are also comforting to fans, a reminder of all the joy surrounding the holiday season. I, I do give Hallmark movies a hard time, and we put them under a microscope they have no business being put under because they, they are someone's comfort food. Christmas has always been a way for me to relax, and these movies are so low stakes. And so with dozens of new titles coming out every year, we asked, what makes an actually good Christmas movie? We have something called the Linus test. And it goes back to a Charlie Brown Christmas where Linus gets on stage and explains to everyone what Christmas is all about. Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. 
So for us, what makes a good Christmas movie is if there is that change of heart at some point. It's where Linus could pop up in any of these movies or television specials or whatever and say, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That's what a good Christmas movie is. That's our definitive test. Casey Mendoza, Chicago. Amazon was already having a blowout year and it's shaping up to be a record-breaking holiday shopping season for the company as well. Shoppers have been increasingly relying on Amazon to deliver goods to their homes during the pandemic and that has proven particularly true as infections soar during the colder months. Amazon said Tuesday that this year's holiday shopping season has been its largest and longest ever. Amazon said the record sales had an effect on small and medium-sized businesses that use the platform. Those online sellers brought in nearly $5 billion between Black Friday and Cyber Monday on Amazon, a 60% increase from last year. Healthcare workers and first responders can now get free coffee at Starbucks. To show appreciation to frontline workers, Starbucks is offering a free tall brewed coffee, hot or iced, through the end of the year. The list of those eligible for the freebie is pretty extensive. It includes doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dispatchers, firefighters, paramedics, police officers, dentists, mental health care workers, active duty military, public health care workers, and any hospital staff. You just have to show your ID. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first day of what we call meteorological winter. That's where we take the three months of winter, December, January, and February, and we put them all together. Just easier to do the math for averaging and things like that. And so today is the first day of meteorological winter. And we even started off with a couple of snow flurries, but since then, all those snow flurries have kind of come and gone and just kind of melted away. And that's the way things are shaping up in the Billings area tonight. In fact, when those snow flurries hit this morning, it kind of melted as soon as they hit the street. But let me show you, we still have a little bit of light snow bringing its way up and towards the uh, Bear Tooth. The priors in the Bighorn Mountains. We have a pretty strong northerly wind pushing some cloudy skies up slope into those uh, mountains and that's why we're still seeing some snowfall. Hey over at Red Lodge Mountain they got seven inches of new snow over there today. That's what the Red Lodge report was saying so yeah impressive isn't it? Let's move on a little bit and show you what's happening here. Some clearing skies up from the north. We think those clearing skies will eventually move into our area push these cloudy skies and snow showers a little bit farther south into Wyoming and so here's the way things are shaping up today. Had a little cold front blow on through that brought some scattered flurries this morning. That's the kind of parked over the south central part of the state and down into Wyoming. But out here, we've got some nice weather out here. Uh, what we call just kind of quiet stuff. High pressure building into the region. We'll continue to see those mostly sunny skies and give us a weatherman holiday right on through the next several days. It'll be 38 degrees on Wednesday, 46 on Thursday, and back into the 50s Friday right on through Tuesday. That's weather. States across the country have been banning indoor dining at restaurants. This has hit a lot of owners hard financially, and one restaurant in Colorado came up with an idea in order to seat guests. It's a little different right now, but we're, um, we're concentrating on what we can do and not dwelling on what we can't control. Pandemic life is all about adapting. It's a little difficult. I mean, we opened this up with the idea of being open. We never opened up with the idea of being a takeout restaurant. Hello, my name is Tim Applegate. I am the managing partner and owner of Sauce on the Blue in Silverthorne, Colorado. Come to Sauce on the Blue. They are the epitome of adaptation. You know, we're still doing takeout on a nightly basis. Um, we hope to get back to being 25, 50% occupancy here in the next couple weeks. And when that happens, we will be ready. You see, like many restaurants across the country, Sauce on the Blue is no different. Empty seats inside. Currently, the restaurant can't have guests inside the building. But as we sat down in August, we realized that, you know, this pandemic was probably going to bounce back. We were probably going to have a second wave. And we thought the best thing for us to do with such a small restaurant inside, if we were down to 25%, let's open things up and let's get four more tables outside. But Tim found a way to stay operating while keeping his customers safe. So we put individual yurts outside, which sit up to six people in each yurt. Well, right now we're allowed six people at a table as long as they're sitting outside. Our yurts are individually set, so they're each individual restaurant rooms, if you would say. So they're allowed to be open on the patio. We hope to be able to do eight people at some point, but for right now, we can only do six. Tim's restaurant in Silverthorne is one of the only places in Colorado where people can actually have a sit down meal, but it's just not a private space for guests. It also comes with a ventilation system. And each one has got its own dome on the top, which allows us to air the unit out between use. So what we do is after the first party will sit, we go through, open the yurt up for five or 10 minutes. We air it out, we open the doors, we sanitize everything. And that allows us to have a clean room for people to come into. For Tim, this just isn't a temporary solution. 
He plans on keeping these every year. We will have these yurts every winter going forward. While this approach can be expensive, it's one of many ideas across the country that Tim hopes can help other restaurants in this time of adapt. Definitely was expensive to do this, but we weren't looking at that. What we were looking at is trying to find a way to keep moving forward, and this was a light thing allowed us to do it. I'm Thomas Hoppo reporting. Special needs students at a high school in Florida received an early holiday gift, a new school bus. The push for a new set of wheels began last September when a parent spearheaded an effort to raise the money. The most challenged kids had absolutely the worst uh, transportation. It just wasn't in the budget to get them something like this and so it had to get done. The new set of wheels replaces the school's 22 year old bus that did not have air conditioning or a wheelchair lift. The latest surge in coronavirus cases has led Girl Scouts in San Diego to cancel all in-person gatherings and campouts for the rest of the year. Now they're trying to do all of their events virtually. Some of us camped in tents in our backyard or forts inside our houses if you couldn't get to your backyard. Troop leaders say the experiences may be different, but that hasn't changed the Girl Scouts mission. We're still definitely trying to make the world a better place, even if from a distance. Now to a woman in Ohio who is creating flowers that last forever. Angie Brooks opened a paper flower shop. She says oftentimes people pop into the shop not realizing the flowers are made from paper and are pleasantly surprised. It's like any other florist. If you need flowers for just your home or office or to gift to somebody, you know, this is an option and the nice thing is uh, they don't die. She says her shop has the ability to make someone's day and that's what matters most.